privileged and honored to have another young person come and minister the word tonight. And I know he, he's nervous. I've seen him back there pacing a little bit, but he'll be all right. But Brother Cameron, if you would make your way up here, and he's going to deliver what the Lord has on his heart and what the Lord has been uh, ministering to him. And I'm just thankful for all these young adults and all these teens that are willing to get up and deliver the word. If you would, just stretch your hands this way. We're going to pray for him as he comes tonight. Just stretch your hands this way. God, we come before you this evening. We thank you for Brother Cameron. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in his life. And Lord, I ask that you would just anoint him to bring forth your word tonight. Lord, speak to and through him, Jesus, and just use him. Make him a vessel that you're willing to use. And Lord, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In tonight's service, in Jesus' name, we pray. And the church says, amen. Give Brother Cameron a hand tonight. All right. Good evening, good evening. I'm used to saying good morning with my students, but good evening. Um, aren't we glad that Jesus has never lost a battle? The Lord has never lost a battle. I love that song. I was back there pacing, but also worshiping. But it, that song always gets to me because, you know, he's never lost a battle, and he never will, and he never will. But tonight we are going to be speaking, or I'm going to be speaking and reading out of 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. Pretty familiar um, scripture here. Um, so if you all could rise while we read um, the word here. I want you guys to get there. Right. I know I've been nervous to speak. I don't know why I'm so nervous this time, but it's, it's a little different than any message I've preached before, so... Or spoke before, so this I, I guess that's why I'm so nervous, but uh, we'll get through it together. If not, I'll just stutter a ton and we'll be okay. My students will get over it as well. That's how they see every, every day. So. so the Bible reads in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 9, the Bible reads, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. So y'all may be seated, but (laughs) that is where I'm going to read. I was going to read the entire chapter or chapter four, um, but I wasn't even really going to preach out of this chapter, but I I was reading through Paul's life and that's who I was going to preach about. I was going to speak on Paul and his life and all the the trials and all the tribulations that he had to go through. Uh, Well, of course, it was Saul first and then Paul, but I was going to speak on that, but then I was reading through, and I noticed the letters that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, which are what Corinthians are. That's, That's what the whole purpose of them are. They're basically Peter, or not Peter, but Paul's letters to the church at Corinth. And I was reading through these, and this passage, this little section just jumped out at me because everything that Paul went through, and he's telling this to the church at Corinth because the the letters there, if you read 1 Corinthians, the letter um, is really just about, you know, keeping the church together and trying to to write the, the path that they're on and try to correct them and tell them how they are supposed to conduct themselves, so on and so forth. And then when we read into 2 Corinthians, we see that he's trying to unify the church. That's what he's trying to do here. He's trying to keep them together and to stand strong. Because he says in this portion here, it says that we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. There's a lot of stuff going on during this time when it comes to Christianity. And I know Another reason that this probably popped out into my mind is because, luckily enough, even though I am a public school teacher, there is a few, a little section in my standards where I can talk about Christianity. And of course, me being me, I take as much advantage of that as possible. It's only supposed to be a week. I make it two to three, but um, they can get over it. Uh, the state can anyway. So um, just if they're watching, please don't fire me. But um, that's kind of what I see and what I take advantage of because uh, of who I am and how I was raised and, and what I want the kids to take away from this. So one thing that I do when I get a textbook and everything in class, I like to look and see what it says about the Bible and what it says about these historical figures that are also biblical figures like David, Paul, and a lot of these other um, people as well as I want to see what it says about Jesus. And when I was Uh, teaching about Christianity and the spread of Christianity, uh, it really talks about this portion. It talks about Paul a lot. My my textbook does. There's a whole section about Paul. And I really like the textbook we have this year because it talks about how Paul is a very important figure and that he 
was one of the people that really spread Christianity to the the reaches that it was. And he spread it all throughout what at that time was the Roman Empire. But of course, Paul, we know if you read anything about Paul, he wasn't always Paul. He was Saul to start with. And he was one of the Romans that was persecuting the Christians. If you go back and read in Acts, he actually went in and would go into people's houses and take them out of their houses, drag them out and arrest them for being Christian. And also would, he did kill people that were Christian. And then, of course, we see, and you continue reading in Acts, and like a chapter later, Paul then converts to, or Saul then converts to Christianity and becomes Paul and goes on this life journey that we see all throughout Acts, all the way to Galatians, really, about where he's now preaching the gospel and reaching the people that need to be reached. So I really just love the fact that, my, that I was able to talk to that and tell a lot of kids that and, and be able to influence them in that way. But it was just super interesting that, that the worldly school that I teach, we all know how bad the world's getting, and it's really starting in my profession in the schoolhouse, and I see it every day. It's getting rougher and rougher and rougher every single day as, as we go on. But it's the world we live in, and of course, I'm trying to be in there to change it. But we see... And it talks about Paul and, and about how he goes out and spreads it to the Roman Empire, everything like that. And when I was reading this as well, I was also planning a lesson in my, uh, hist- in my other history class about World War I. And it brought up a character that I, I knew from World War I and World War II, so that era. And his life kind of matched up with Paul's in, in my eyes. And his name is Desmond Doss. Have anyone heard from Desmond Doss? I'll do participation. Raise a hands. Anybody? Jade. Jade has. Perfect. So no one does. Perfect. So I'll tell the story about him. So Desmond Doss was a World War uh, II veteran, obviously, at the end of it all. But he was a a young man. He was about 26 uh, when he saw and heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor. And Doss was an old Virginia boy. He's a country boy, and he was raised in an old southern church. And he believed in fighting and standing up for what he thought was right and everything like that. So on April 1st, he goes down to the um, recruitment station, and he signs up for the war. He signs up on April 1st, 1942, but he signs a, and checks a box that a lot of people never check if they're signing up for war. He signs the box to where he says he is a conscientious objector. Now, if any of you guys know anything or have heard of that term, conscientious objector, what it is, and I have the direct definition from the state or, well, the country, it says, a conscientious objector is someone who refuses to serve due to moral or religious reasons. So you think, you probably are thinking to yourself, how did he even get into war? He signed the box where, you know, you basically get out of, get out of war free card, basically. But Doss wanted to serve no matter what. He, he knew what was right and wanted to stand for what was right. So Doss says in his um, admissions, he says, I don't care, I don't need a gun, I just want to do what is right. So he decides that he's going to sign up for the war and never be able to train with a weapon. So he goes out and goes through basic training, almost fails basic training because they don't mark him off for his rifle training because he never picked up a rifle. And of course the people were mad at him because then his uh, battalion and his group was then ridiculed and had to do extra drills, had to do extra cleaning, had to do all of this other stuff because he refused to pick up a gun. And we see that he eventually gets trained and does pass basic training by the skin of his teeth and gets trained to be a medic. And he becomes a pretty good medic, but he's marching in without a rifle, without a pistol, without any weapon to defend himself. And we see that he goes to a few battles here and there. And then he comes to probably the apex of his life and his journey in the military. And that is at Hacksaw Ridge. So Hacksaw Ridge is a place in Okinawa, Japan, which is who we were really fighting out. And I think it's in Japan, actually. It might be one of the Pacific Islands out there. But it's out there um, where we were really fighting in World War II. At this point, Hacksaw Ridge... uh, Germany already surrendered to the war, just historical fact. So we were really just fighting Japan to kind of, you know, take them over during this whole point because that's who we were really fighting with during this whole World War II situation. And we see that Doss and his division, they're trying to take this ridge. And this ridge is set up very, you know, very sketchy, really. You have a small beachhead and you have a 400-foot uh, 
cliff. And it's just 400 foot straight up cliff. And the US soldiers, or at least the people in DOS's unit, their job is to go up that 400 foot cliff and take the ridge and take the little plateau up there. And of course, the Japanese know that they're coming, so they hold up and fortify up there on that plateau. And one day, they decide that his battalion decides they're going to climb up that ridge and attack it. And it's pretty successful. They take the ridge for the first about two, three hours of the battle. And then the Japanese, as soon as the Americans are kind of getting comfortable at top and getting everyone up, the Japanese launch a counterattack. And this counterattack is very successful. Um, there is less than one third that are able to retreat. Less than one third of his battalion runs back, goes down, back down the ridge where they have it fortified just in case, you know, the Japanese would try to march down atop of this ridge. But we see that only a third of his battalion and the group that is attacking make it back down. And Doss does not make it back down. Doss hides and stays on top of the ridge. And this is where Doss's story gets a little interesting. He waits for nightfall to come and he goes out and starts bringing people back to the ridge. We're talking about the wounded, the people who were shot, the people who had their, you know, not to be graphic or anything, but had their legs blown off in this battle. People who were in pain, people who were in trouble. He goes over and one by one drags them back to this ridge and lowers them by himself 400 feet down this ridge and has lines of people helping these people as soon as they get down this ridge. But he doesn't just do it to one person because one person would, one life, saving one life would have been amazing, but he just didn't do it to one person. He didn't do it to two people, didn't do it to three people, didn't do it to 10 people, not 20, not 30, not 40, not 50, but 75 men make it back down that cliff. After the whole battle's over, 75 men in the middle of the night start coming down, lowering down from this cliff, all because of one man, and that's Desmond Doss. And each one of them were interviewed after this whole process, and each one of them said that this crazy man that was lowering, down, lowering them down this hill also, one second, forgot. Desmond Doss looks like this. He's about six foot tall, like 150. Um, so he's not a big guy, but he's lowering down these people that signed up for war. And obviously, you signed up for war in World War II. You know, you think of the, the typical, you know, six foot four, big buff guy. So he's lowering down those people all the way down this 400 foot tall ridge and 75 of them. And each one of these people say, go back to their leader, whoever they went to back um, at the camp when they were getting help, and they were like, who got you down? And they were expecting a whole team and them to say like, oh man, these guys are up here, you know, getting us down. No, they all said Desmond Doss. All of them said Desmond Doss. And they said that this crazy guy was whispering, one more, one more. And you could probably imagine, he's probably tired, but he just kept saying, one more, one more, one more. Lord, help me get one more. Lord, help me get one more. And he sat there, looked up in the sky, and just kept saying, Lord, help me get one more. And he saved 75 men that night. And this was the same guy during basic training that was getting picked on. The same guy that was getting yelled at, being called basically an idiot for not running into war and not training to, in warfare. But he's sitting there saving these lives, saving 75 people's lives. Some of those 75 were Japanese lives because he saw every life as valuable. And he said, Lord, help me get one more. They were people trying to kill him, the Japanese were. And he is helping them, taking them back to this ridge, lowering them 400 feet down to safety. And that's always stuck out to me because this is one of my favorite history stories about anything in World War II, but he just kept saying, Lord, help me get one more. Now church, when are we gonna get a mindset where we say, Lord, help me get one more? Lord, let me get one more opportunity. Let me get one more chance to go tell somebody about you. Let me get one more moment around somebody so I can impact them and reflect them. I know our Bible says in Matthew 28, 18, that we are supposed to go out and preach the nation or preach the gospel to all nations. It, that's our job here. And Doss goes out and he says, let me get one more person. He didn't, have, didn't do it all at once. He didn't pick 75 people up. I mean, I could barely pick up one person, but picking up 75 people at once is impossible. So he had to do it one at a time. And church, we don't have to do it all at once. Paul didn't do it all at once. Back to where my passage that I was reading, he didn't do it all at once. 
Paul was even seen as a failure. I know my Bible has a little section here that I'm going to read real quick uh, talking about Paul. And it says something that I never really thought of Paul about because he's been, he was this great figure. But it calls him a successful failure. Because he was. He was a successful failure. He admitted that he was the worst of all sinners. And uh, first Titus, I'm pretty sure, is where that's at. And he had the wrong priorities. His life was hard. We see in 2 Corinthians, he talks about the thorn in his side. And he talks about all of these things and all this persecution that was happening to him. He was imprisoned. He was basically at death's door multiple times because people were ridiculing him and persecuting him for just standing on the word and, and speaking and reaching and doing what God called him to do. And Paul and Doss, both of them, understood what their call was. Doss knew that he should not have went out there with a gun. He knew that his job was to go out there and help people and save people. It did not matter who it was. He wanted to go out there and save people and impact people's lives. So church, we need to get the same mindset as Paul and Desmond here. And we need to get the mindset of, Lord, help me get one more. Because that's what my prayer's been recently, is, Lord, help me get one more opportunity. Let me get one more chance to talk to somebody about you. Let me get one more moment with my family to introduce God to some people who are out there and that are lost. And I know we all know somebody that's out there that's struggling right now. Lord, let me be able to speak into them, the people that are struggling right now. Let me, give me that moment. Let me get one more moment to speak to them. So Lord, not Lord, but church, let us capitalize on every moment and help us get one more. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. What he was reading there really stuck out to me in the story he told of Desmond Doss because what Paul was saying is that even in the trouble, even in the distress, even being perplexed, even being in despair, even being persecuted and forsaken, I'm not destroyed. Even in the adversity, I'm not overcome. And we know that what the, the Word of God says, that greater is He that is in us than he that is in the world. I, I'm going to do this in 15 minutes. Y'all ready? I got one person says go for it. All right, y'all ready? All right, let's try this. I'm going to be in Luke chapter 2, and I believe these tie in together. If you, if you just kind of read into it, because he's talking about getting more souls, and I want to talk about being who God's called us to be so we can get more souls. I'm going to do this real quick. Luke chapter 2, I'm going to begin reading in verse Number 25, just real quick, Jesus has been born, and the Bible tells us that the time has been fulfilled, he has been circumcised, he has been named, and now he is being brought to the temple to be dedicated to the Lord. He's being brought to the temple to be dedicated to the Lord. It says in verse 25, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting on the consolation or the salvation or the deliverance of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then he took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lestest thou, thou servant depart in peace according to thy word. For my eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. Verse 36, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of, I can't say his name, of the tribe of Asher. And she was of a great age, 
and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting, fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all, or to all, to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Let us pray real quick. God, we thank you for this service. We thank you, Lord, for what Brother Cameron has brought to our attention tonight. And Lord, we thank you for your word and its anointing. We ask that your word go forth in that anointing and do what only your word can do. And we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So we read here in our text, uh, again, this is kind of Christmas themed. I didn't intend for it to be that way. Um, just like I didn't intend for last week to be that way. But we see that Simeon and Anna are people, spiritual people, spiritually minded people, and they are people that are looking for something to come to pass. They are waiting for a promise to come to pass. How many knows that sometimes we have to wait for God to do things in our life? We have to wait for God to open doors or to give us opportunities or to give us directions or to, to give us signs, so to speak, to know what to do, when to do it, and where to do it, and how to do it. But we find that Simeon and Anna are waiting on the arrival of of a gift, or the, the arrival of a Savior. This, this Savior by the name of Jesus, this is someone that has been prophesied about for thousands of years in the Jewish culture. This is someone that has been foretold about for thousands, literally thousands of years, uh, promised uh, at the beginning of time uh, and, and to this point. And we're looking, they're, 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 we're looking at some people that have been waiting a long time, a lifetime to see this Jesus, this Savior, come to their nation, to their world, to their, their people. And we see that they, they were waiting quite a long time, but I want you to realize uh, just for a moment the fact of the validity of Jesus and who he is. This gift, this gift uh, was prophesied about over and over and over again in the Old Testament. The Bible, there was a mathematician by the name of Peter Stone, and he looked into it and he said for, for one man to just fulfill 40 eight Old Testament prophecies about the Savior, the one that the Jews were looking for as a Savior, it would be a one and ten with 157 zeros after that likelihood of someone just fulfilling 48 prophecies. Jesus' birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection fulfilled over 324 biblical prophecies. He, he fulfilled every Old Testament prophecy there was. So you, you say, this is, this is, this, why are you saying this? I'm showing you this because this is, this is prophecy. This is a promise that they've been waiting on to, to see fulfilled. This is something in their culture that they've talked about for thousands of years. It's, it's a big deal to them. And they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting for this gift. And then the day comes, the promise comes comes through the door. The gift comes wrapped in, in, in a blanket maybe or, or in, in some sort of robe to be dedicated to the Lord in the arms of Mary, maybe in the arms of Joseph, but coming to be dedicated to the Lord. And we see that Simeon and Anna approach this baby and they're, they're excited and they're glad and they're rejoicing because it, it has come. It has finally happened. And many of us would say if we had waited on, for, on something for decades and decades and centuries and centuries and thousands thousands of years, uh, that we would be pretty excited too to see it finally come to pass, that this prophecy, this promise would be fulfilled, that this gift that you'd waited on had finally arrived. I know we're in a Christmas season, and, and many of us, maybe uh, I have something that, that are, are, is waiting. I'm waiting for it to get in. I hope that it makes it on time. It don't have much time to get here, and I hope that it gets here on time. But I want you to know that what, what I see in the church today 
is that we are as Simeon and Anna and we are looking day in and day out and waiting day in and day out saying, God, I, I, I'm waiting for you to do something. I'm waiting for you to, to, to give us the gift. I'm waiting for you to, to send something our way. Uh, but I want you to know that gift that came, and, and his name is Jesus, uh, is salvation. And I want you to know that salvation is a gift and a salvation is free. But not only are we given the gift of salvation, and we talk about the gift of salvation, knowing who Jesus is, believing in him, uh, repenting and turning our lives toward him. Uh, but we know that Jesus talks about another gift, uh, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, and we see that that he even instructs uh, the disciples that there is going to be a, a small waiting period, uh, but you will be endued with power uh, from on high. It was a promise. It was a prophecy. It was a gift uh, that Jesus was giving to them, but they, they had to, to wait on it. But now we see that the Holy Spirit has arrived in Acts chapter 2 uh, and Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost uh, and he says you know what was prophesied about uh, in the book of Joel and the writings of Joel uh, this is it this is God pouring out his spirit uh, but you say what what are you trying to tie together and this is this is where I'm going to get to and, and we're going to get done if Maddie wants to go ahead and come to the piano she can but this is what I want to get to uh, is that we have become people that are waiting for a gift we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting like Simeon and Anna. And I know they were waiting for a prophetic promise. Uh, they were waiting for something that God had promised them. Uh, but I, I will tell you something uh, that I, I, I'm just going to be very honest with you. Uh, when the church starts saying, uh, and I, I've been convicted about this myself, oh, I want, I want revival. Uh, I want God to do something. We're waiting for a gift to walk in the door. We're waiting for just the right service. We're waiting for just the right time. Listen, I understand that God moves in times and seasons. I understand that God is sovereign. I understand these things. But the church is sitting here waiting and waiting and waiting. But I want you to know that when that gift walked through the temple doors and they celebrated because they said, it's here, it's here. I want you to know that was 2,000 years ago. And that gift uh, named Jesus, uh, is, it, it, it's already here. The gift of the Holy Spirit, it's already here. And what we do, Marie, is what we do is we say, oh, God, send us the next thing, send us the next thing. Send us the next thing. But what I want you to understand is what happens is, is we oftentimes look in the wrong direction. We're waiting for something just to come in and knock our socks off. But we don't even realize he's already given us the gifts. Well, I want God to come down and sit in my bedroom and sit on my bed and tell me what I'm supposed to do. Even though God's told me what to do, he's given me the gifts. I, I need 27 confirmations to do what he's called me to do. Well, I, I can't do it, Pastor Jade. I, I, I'm, I, I'm unworthy. I'm, I'm self. I, I, I struggle. Listen, you just heard Brother Cameron talk about a man that we consider as high in the faith, a, a leader of the faith, a, an apostle of the faith. And guess what? He said, I have a thorn in my flesh. I have problems. Peter was considered a leader of the church. And the dude denied Jesus. But see, what we need to understand is it's not about us being perfect. We should strive to, to, to walk after Christ. We should strive to be Christ-like. Don't get me wrong. But I, I want you to know it's not that God calls perfect people or qualified people. He gives His gifts. You say, what, what are you getting at? I, don't have the, I do not have the power to lay hands on Carly and say... Be healed. Whatever issue it is, it is the gift of God that he has given me. But you see, the thing about a gift is it has to be received. You say, okay, well, the gift of salvation, I, I'm saved. Gift of the Holy Ghost, I have that. But the Bible tells us about other gifts. 
The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, he gives some, can you come get this? He gives some teachers, Carly, come get this. He gives some prophets. Can I have, can I have that name tag back? He said, well, the, this is the fivefold ministry. But if you, if you read verse 12, he says, this is for the church. The fivefold ministry is for the church. He gives some. Apostles, come here. Logan, come here. He gives some apostles. Emily, come up here. He gives some evangelists. And I know this ain't shouting it down. This ain't awesome. He gives some Sarah, could you help me out? He gives some pastors. And again, he says, this is for the edifying of the church. These people have gifts to operate in these anointings. For the church, it's a gift. And we sit around and say, well, I don't know what I'm called to do. I don't know what I should be doing. Seek to receive the gifts. But then you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And Paul begins to write to the Corinthians. He said, you know, we're all one body. But we all do different things. And he begins to say that some. He says, some have the gift of faith. Brother Chris, can you help me out? Some have the gift of faith. And then he says, Some have the gift of healing. Brother Austin, you want to help me out? But what happens in this season, the season of Christmas, we talk about the gift that God sent Jesus to this earth. But do you realize that because Jesus came and because the Holy Spirit was sent, that's why Jesus said, it's expedient for me to go away. So the Holy Spirit will come. Why? Because He has gifts. But what good is the gift if it's not received? What good is the gift if it's never opened, it's never used? What would my wife think if she paid hundreds of dollars for a gift and I would not open it? And this is what our Bible says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whosoever would believe in Him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. He gave. And then Jesus on this earth talked about the Holy Spirit. He gave. Went to the cross. He gave. He rose. He gave. Day of Pentecost. He gave. But now, we look and we look and we look and the gifts are here. They're within you through the Holy Spirit. Just say, God, I want to receive what you have for me. i got to submit myself to you. i got to get out of my own way. If you would, stand with me across this house.
day in and day out, Simeon and Anna waited. And then it came. We need to get excited because it's here. Because it's here. I want you to lay hands on the person next to you on their shoulder. And I just want you to begin to pray for them. God, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray for callings to be revealed. I pray for gifts to be made manifest. Lord Jesus, I, 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 I did not have the time to explain all the gifts that you, you have for us. But Lord Jesus, I ask that you begin to reveal because Lord, I know there's pastors, there's teachers. I know there's intercessors, Father. I know, Lord Jesus, that there there are people that you're calling to evangelism, that you're calling, Lord Jesus, uh, uh, to be apostles one day. And and God, I believe, Jesus, that there are those that have the gift of faith, uh, that have the gift of healing. Uh, Lord, and as Corinthians goes on to say, the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. I believe there are those that have gifts, Jesus. I believe there are those under the sound of my voice tonight that have calls, that have purposes, that have plans, Lord, that you've given them. And Lord, I ask that they would just receive. Lord, ask the Lord to reveal. Lord, that they would ask you to reveal. And Lord, they would receive. God, I take that. I receive that. I'll run with that. I'll go with that. As Brother Cameron talked about tonight, it doesn't matter what comes. Lord, let us go after one more. Let us serve faithfully one more day. Let us go after you one more day. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church says, Amen and Amen.